This is the ultimate guide for Call of Dragons. Whether you're a completely new player to the game, or you're just looking to get some optimizations on the account you already have, this video will give you everything you need to know, from your buildings, to your heroes, to the map itself, and the very best artifacts you can choose. This guide will have it all. So stick around in this video for the most comprehensive guide ever created for Call of Dragons. Hello my friends and welcome back, I'm Chisco Gaming, and I have made over 2,000 videos about this genre of game and the predecessor of Call of Dragons, which is Rise of Kingdoms. And I played the Call of Dragons beta for the last six months, so I'm pretty qualified to bring you the information today about how to make the most amazing account possible with the resources at your disposal in Call of Dragons. And if this is the sort of stuff you think you're into, consider subscribing to the channel for more videos just like this one designed to help you get value and smash your enemies and consider smashing the like button on this video to honor my commitment to bringing you the very best information possible. Now, this is a longer video because we're going to be very, very comprehensive together. So consider using the timestamps in the description so you can jump to whichever portion of the video you're most interested in, whether it's an experience gain hack or you want to know how to best upgrade your heroes or it's the buildings themselves, whatever that is. Check the timestamps in the description to navigate to whichever part you want, but I'd recommend going from start to finish in order because we're going to build topics as we go. So let's start with your starting faction, the very beginning. And the only thing you need to know about your starting faction is that it will give you more tokens of a hero so you can advance their skills more. You'll have a quest series that is going to give you those tokens. So I would recommend you pick the League of Order because Waldir is by far the best hero of your starting factions. Waldir is a player versus player hero, and he's a mage, and he's exactly what I would recommend you use. Gwanwyn is fine for player versus environment stuff, but at the end of the day, the real threat is other players. And Wilderberg is kind of cool if you were going infantry, but you shouldn't. You should use a range march, especially if you don't know what you're doing or you're newer to the game. So, League of Order is the easy choice. And if you wanted the special units of another faction for some reason, or the faction bonus, and you were really dead set on that, don't worry. At City Hall level 10, you can just switch factions. And the key is that you lock in whichever hero you're going to get more tokens of because that will not change. So pick League of Order, you'll get Waldir, and the dude's a beast, a true beast. So now let's get a look at the buildings because this is like the first thing you're going to do is start upgrading your buildings. And the most important building is your City Hall. Depending on what faction you choose, it'll have a different name. For me, it's called the Hall of Order because I chose the League of Order. This building is the bottleneck to leveling up every other building in your city and should always be your priority. Do not level every building equally. Only do the prerequisites for the Hall of Order and get that thing leveled up as fast as you can. There are two exceptions, however. Every time you get a new level on your Hall of Order, as soon as you can make the Alliance Center, you should make that building and you should level it up as fast as possible after getting a new City Hall level. This is because the Alliance Center allows other members of your Alliance to help you. And helping reduces the time it takes to either do research or build something new. This is critical to your progression, and it's basically free speedups. It's the first building you do every single time you get a new City Hall level. And after you've done that, you go and you upgrade your College of Order as soon as that's something you can build. Now, this research center might be called something different if you chose a different faction. But the reason you want to level this up is that it will give you more research options and you will get more research speed as you go. So this is your second priority after you level up to a new city hall level. From there, just do the prerequisites to get to the next city hall level and boom, you're good to go. Do not level all buildings equally because that would just take a ton of resources and would ultimately slow your progression. Now from here, there are lots of buildings in your city that we really do need to talk about, and I'll try to move really quickly. One really obvious, important set of buildings is your troop training centers. And your goal with training new troops and doing research and doing building in this game is to have those running 24-7. It's kind of like free speedups. Like if the buildings are ever idle, that's wasted time. You never want to have wasted time. So leveling up your troop training centers is going to do a number of things. One of those things is making it so you can train more troops at a time and makes it so that when you go to work or go to sleep, you can still be training troops 24-7 um, and not have any downtime on these buildings. It's even worth, by the way, doing a small amount of speed ups before you go to bed, even if there's no events, right? Um, in order to then queue something else up 
that will run overnight and run the full duration of the evening when you can't access the game and, or aren't going to play. So the troop training buildings are really great, and there are five of them. There are infantry, there are archers or marksmen, there are cavalry, which is also where you're going to train your gathering unit, which we'll talk about in a bit. There's also mages, and then there's your special unit, which for the League of Order is called a celestial. Um, each of these buildings is very important. You want to level them up. But let's go very briefly through some of these other buildings. The scout camp is critical to your ability to actually explore the map. The higher level on the scout camp, the faster your scouts move, the more exploration range they can see, and also the more scouts you get. So faster scouting of the entire map. From here, we can talk about your hospitals. Now, we're going to talk more about healing later in the video, but your hospitals determine how much healing you can do per day, whether you do it for free or the resources. Your storehouse determines how many of your resources are protected. So if an enemy hits your city, they can only take the resources exceeding what your storehouse will protect. So obviously, the storehouse is important, but more important is that you just keep your city on your alliance's territory. We'll talk more about that, but if your city's on territory, you can't be attacked, you can't lose resources. From here, we can talk about the Watchtower, which will sort of protect your city, and I'll just simply say this does far less than you think. It's more of just a prerequisite for other buildings than it is something that actually protects you. And then there is also your Rally Center, the Rally Beacon, which determines the number of troops that can be in your rally. Very, very important if you are a rally leader, uh, but for the most part, not something you need to worry about too much at the start of the game. One other building that is really critical is your wall. Your wall is where you can set your defenders for your city. You can set multiple defender combinations, so if your main combination is out of your city, your secondary, then tertiary, then fourth, and then fifth options will be promoted by default, depending on, again, which heroes are in your city and which heroes are out of your city. The wall is definitely important because when your wall's durability hits zero, I believe that your city is ported away from its location. That is very difficult to do, though. Your wall would have to be burning for quite a while. Another building that is sort of important is your alliance market. This won't really affect you much at the start of the game other than being a prerequisite for other buildings. Your market will determine the amount of resources you can send at a time. It will determine the amount of resources you can plunder from other players, and it will also determine the amount of resources you can be sent per week. In addition, there is a tax rate whenever you send resources. The higher level the building is, the less you get taxed for sending resources. So if you are going to transfer resources for some reason, the higher level the building, the better. Now, there are a couple other really important buildings, like your production buildings. In this game, there are four critical resources. The most plentiful are... Uh, gold and wood, followed by stone, and then followed by mana. Now, technically, they're equally sort of plentiful on the map themselves, but a level one resource node has different amounts of each of these resources. For example, um, you'll get lots of gold and uh, lumber. Those have 126,000 in a level one node. The foundry, the stone, will have 96,000 in a level one node. And the mana will have 42,000 in a level one node. So it takes a lot longer to get the same amount of mana as you have of other resources like lumber. So they are technically equally available on the map, um, but the less uh, common, the more rare, uh, more precious resource is mana above all other things. Now, weirdly, mana can't actually be stolen by other players. So I wouldn't recommend ever that you open your resources in this game unnecessarily. Just wait until you're about to actually build or do research or whatever you're going to do that needs the resources. Um, because when they're open, they can be plundered. My understanding is that mana can't be plundered, but I still don't open mine because it just seems really risky to have all your resource tokens open. Just open them only as you need them, okay? Now from here, there are a couple other buildings that we can talk about. One is your goblin market. Um, that is where you can trade. There are a number of ways that you can do this. One is that the merchant will periodically show up and she'll have discounts on things that you ultimately might want to buy. Some of that uses gems. Some of it uses resources. The other thing you can do is actually trade in items. So you can trade in, for example, tokens on heroes that you no longer need. Like, for example, I've got Kella here. I already have all her skills maxed. I can scrap those. And then I can exchange for stuff I actually want, like at some point I'll have enough currency to get gold keys, which seems really good. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the video. Now from here, 
I want to zero in on a couple buildings and talk more in depth. And let's start with research. Research is really critical in Call of Dragons, and there's some research that matters more than others. There are two trees of research in this game. You have economic technology and war technology. The critical economic technology is your architecture, which influences your building speed, your scholarship, which influences your research speed, your breath control, which influences the rate with which you recover combat points or command points, and also military leadership, which influences the speed with which your heroes level up. These are things you want to max as soon as you possibly can because they give you economy in different ways. The building speed makes it so you can build up your city faster. The research speed makes it so you can progress your research more, right? And the commander experience and also breath control, which gives you combat point recovery or command point recovery, is really critical in leveling up your heroes. These are things you want to max as soon as you possibly can. The other things are less important. Um, they matter, but you can do them in time. But always max out your architecture as fast as you can. Always max out your scholarship as fast as you can, even when you unlock higher and higher levels of it, because it gives you scale. It gives you efficiency for more things that you do in the game. Now, on the com uh, combat side of things, the critical things you're looking for is new tiers of troops. That's like the, the main thing you want here. New tiers of troops. Do the minimum necessary to get a new tier of troop. Okay. Tier two troops are in green over here. Then you'll have in blue your tier threes. Your purple troop, troops here are your tier fours. And your goldies, once you get there in the long run, many players it will take a year to get here, is your tier five troops. It's just going to take a very, 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 very long time. There is only one economy based thing in the military tree. And that is your conscription, which improves your training speed by 10%. This is really, really good in uh, making it so that you can train troops faster. You don't want to use lots of speed ups training troops, ideally, until you've pushed on your uh, conscription to get as much edge as you can, okay? You are going to need to train troops, but I always like to get economy and scaling of that economy as fast as possible. Now, one other thing you need to know about your technology is that there are three columns of technology at the start that you actually can get by exploring the map and looking at villages. And we'll talk more about villages and, and exploration a little bit later on, but some amount of this original tech you can get from exploration. I will point out, however, the earlier tech is always cheaper and for the amount of time it takes to research is just really, really efficient. So I wouldn't stop from researching this early stuff just because you're still exploring the map. I think you want to bang those out because they are just so high value. Now, you'll notice I do have a second research queue running here. I have two of them. And if you're like, bro, how do you have two research queues? I want it. This comes from VIP. And I suppose this is a fine time to talk about the store, another building in your city. Click the little coconutty shield thing in the middle here and you go to your store. Um, and this is your VIP section. Now, I rushed VIP 15. This is a topic for a separate video, but I'll have a card up in the top in case you want to watch a more detailed explanation of VIP. What you need to know about VIP at the start is that you want to rush VIP level 8. At VIP level 8, you will get a second research queue. This is undoubtedly a better priority than anything else for your gems other than one thing only. And that one thing only is getting another building queue. An extra building queue is a very big deal, and it only costs you 5,000 gems. Very easy to do, or you can buy it for five bucks. If you want the second research queue, I would strongly recommend every gem going into VIP because not only do you get the second research queue at level eight, but you also get 5% more research speed. Now, remember, an extra research or building queue is kind of like a free 24 hour speed up for either research or building, respectively, because you can have research running 24 7 in addition to the other research you were doing. So, this is Better than saving for lucky spins or anything else that the game is offering you because it will be value for a very, 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 very long time. Um, the other thing you get at VIP level eight that is super worth is you start getting a legendary token every day. You get to select which hero you want a token of, which is a big deal. I've chosen Thea in this instance. We'll talk more about heroes in just a bit. Leading up to this point, you're going to get epic tokens. Um, you know, epics are great, uh, but the legendaries are obviously way, way, way stronger. So that's one more reason why rushing VIP 8 gives you long-term benefits. But the other thing is it also gives you access to a store. 
And in the store, you can either spend resources or gems in order to get some very important stuff. And some of this is gated by your VIP level. So there are lots of important things in here. I will say every single week, you should absolutely spend resources to get CP recovery items. These are very, very, very critical. If you're spending lots of money in the game, you start to look at things like the keys and speed ups and artifacts. Um, but don't get distracted with speed ups and spending gems on stuff like this if you're not VIP level eight and you don't have enough gems to spin the lucky wheel event when it shows up, okay? Now from here, I wanna talk about one more building and it's research related. And this is called your notice board. Around city hall level eight, remember the name of your city hall will be slightly different depending on what faction you choose. Um, you'll get this notice board, and one thing that's critical on here is this little throne icon. This is called your policies. Seasonal policies are yet another vector for research, and they reset at the end of each season. I'll talk about season reset a little bit later in the video, but these policies are critical to your development, and they take a special currency, not resources like your regular research. They take what's called prestige. You can get your prestige a couple ways. One is that there are going to be holy sites called behemoths, and those behemoths have guardians around them. When you defeat the behemoth guardians, you get a small amount of prestige. You also get the majority of your prestige from a thing called the dragon trail, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And unlike your regular research, which you can speed up, in the policy center, you can only spend gems. Now, it doesn't matter how many hours the research takes, you just spend 80 gems and it will rush whatever that research is. You still need to have, however, the prestige in order to start that research. Now, there are very critical things in your policies that you'll want to focus on at the start of a season. One is military expansion. The more troops you have in your march, the more successful you can be in combat. You also will really want artifact expertise and war studies, making it so you get more artifact experience and hero experience. But the critical thing that you could really mess up that you don't want to do is that you absolutely must pick free healing. Do not pick resource-based healing. At this juncture, you choose one or the other. I made the mistake of doing resource healing, but I'm a spender, so this might actually be value to me. But if you're not a big spender, you you and even if you are, you absolutely want to choose the free healing. At the start of the game, resources are just too rare, man. Um, you need them for too many things. It's too expensive. Go with the free healing, okay? You'll have that critical decision point also over here with medical seminars, and also all the way at the end, you can either do resource-based, or free healing. Go with the free healing. You'll have to take my word for it. But that is the freaking jam, okay? The key thing you're looking to do in this tree is just push further and further and down the tree, higher and higher with your tech. Just keep in mind that the further you go into the tree, the far more expensive prestige-wise these things become. So prestige will become a bottleneck for some of these technologies or speed ups, aka spending gems, will become a bottleneck for progressing your policies. Now you can max out your policies for a tiny amount of gems compared to uh, seasonal research I've seen in other games. So this is, in the grand scheme of things, not as bad as other season-based technologies like we've seen, for example, in Rise of Kingdoms. So from here, what I wanna do is show you the dragon trail very briefly, because this is where you actually get your prestige. And at the start of a new account, it's critical that you progress your way through the dragon trail, which is just a series of challenges where you set what heroes you want, okay? Um, and you then battle. And completing these missions will give you not only um, prestige, but it also gives you experience tomes, and it also gives you a currency for a special store. From this store, the critical thing you want to work on is Indus. Forget everything else that's here. Just work on your Indus, in my opinion. That's the game plan. If you're free to play or a low spender, you could go for epics, I guess, but I, I really think Indus is the play for just about everybody, okay? Um, in addition, you'll be able to periodically loot, and looting is basically passive accumulation of experience, dragon glass, which is the currency for the store I just showed you, and prestige. Um, and the more stars you have on these missions, the more of the loot you'll collect per hour. In fact, you can even quick loot. You can spend gems three times and you can do it once for free. Uh, if you are spending in the game, you should be gemming this. If you're not spending, don't sweat it. Um, however, there are special missions that don't use your troops and your heroes. The special missions off to the side that you see over here are special scenarios designed to teach you the game. And the game will give you 
a sort of configuration of things that you might not actually have. So for here, they want me to use the Phoenix Eye, they want me to use Eliana, they want me to use Waldir, and they're recommending Vestals as the unit, right? So there are side missions that only give one star, and these give special rewards as well, including a bunch of gold keys. So don't neglect your side missions in the Dragon Trail as well. Wow. So we've covered a lot so far, but we haven't even really talked about the heroes. And that's the most exciting part of the game. So let's do that now. In Call of Dragons, you have three rarities of heroes. Your legendaries are gold, your epics are purple, and your uh, blue heroes are advanced, I guess. I don't actually know what they're called. Um, now, heroes are have several vectors for improvement. One is that you level them up. Another is that you star them up. Another is that you skill them up. And another is that you apply talent points, okay? A lot to cover. Oh, let's not recommend, uh, forget the artifact as well, which is important. So what are all these things? Your hero level will come from experience tomes and battling darklings. Don't worry, we'll talk more about darklings. Your star level comes from medals. When you reach a certain level, you can gain a new star level. So for example, if I wanted, I could take Pan to a higher star level by using these medals. However, I'm not going to yet. Um, but uh, the star level unlocks different things. At two stars, you unlock the second skill of the hero. At three stars, you unlock the third skill and you can bring a second hero. So your march, your army can now have two heroes. That's a big deal. Um, at four stars, you unlock the fourth skill. You may think, Chisco, why do you not want to unlock everything right away? Well, the first skill on a hero was always better than every other skill. And you want to max the first skill before you unlock later skills. Because when you unlock later skills, now skill assignment is random. So instead of your skill ups going exactly where you want on that first skill, they'll go randomly to all open skills. The max level of any skill is five. So once you reach the max level of the skill, no more points will go into it. But what you'll often hear in videos is a description of like 5111 or 5511. That's just referring to the skill levels in order of these first four skills. The fifth skill here is called the awakening skill. And this becomes available to you when every single other skill is maxed and you reach level 40. Very important. You have to be level 40 for the awakening skill to then be available for you. Now, if you wanted to see what it looks like to apply more skills, for example, when you click the skills button, you'll have the option over here of using some of your universal tokens if you wanted, or the dedicated hero tokens that you've accumulated over time. If you're wondering where do I get these hero tokens, a part of that is going to come from quests, and a part of that is going to come from this building over here, the tavern. When you make your way over to the hero recruitment section of the tavern, you can use gold keys to unlock heroes. Hopefully we get lucky. Looks like I didn't get particularly lucky. I got an epic. It's Krieg. He's fine. Um, but, you know, I'm mostly interested in the legendaries at this point. Um, so you want to open your keys as soon as you get them. The only reason that I haven't is because I saved them for videos like what I did just there. Um, now, if we make our way back to our heroes, we talked about starring up heroes. We talked about leveling up heroes. But as you level up heroes, you get talent points. And talents in this game are really powerful. Having the right talent build is also really critical. This is why, by the way, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, I'd recommend that you do so because I'm in process of making videos about the talents for every single hero in the game. It's going to take me a while, but I'm getting there, okay? Now, the way that talents work is really interesting in Call of Dragons. First, you need to finish your foundation talents. Then you can work on three different talent trees. Each hero has different talent tree combinations, which means there are different combinations of talents available. And you can go and push the button in the upper right like I just did to unlock or to reveal different presets of talents. So you could work on different presets and you can play around with different builds without the cost of switching because switching your talents in this game is expensive. It costs like a thousand gems or you can get an item maybe at a discount and it'll run you less than that. You don't want to be changing your talents all the time. You want to get them right. You don't want to pay a gem tax, okay? So when you unlock talents in this game, I want to show you how this works because it's very interesting. In order to unlock a new row of talents, you have to put talents into the preceding row. So in order to get this, I have to do three talents over here in the previous tier. In order to get the next tier, I gotta do three talents over here. In order to get the next tier, I gotta do three talents over here. And then I unlock this major talent and now I'm into the three different trees. So from here, I wanna show you something very important, which is that you might think, okay, so I'm adding talent points over here, okay? Um, what if I put five over here and I wanna unlock this final talent, okay? These are really big. These talents, you can only pick one or the other. 
So unlike other parts of the tree where if I want, I can put points in, in different things, okay? Um, you can only do one or the other at these major decision points here and up here, okay? Over here, same story. Over here, same story. Over here, same story. It's one or the other. You only can pick one. And once you pick that one, it'll be grayed out. But you'll also notice I put 10 points in this row. It didn't unlock these major talents for me yet. You really have to do five talents in the very like previous tier, the, the preceding tier. So I can do five over here, let's say, and now those become available to me. You see what I mean? So you can always double back to put more talents into the tree if you want. But the reason most trees look kind of like this, where you're very efficiently trying to get to the highest tier possible, is because um, the you know sort of later talents in the tree can be very powerful depending on what heroes and combinations that you're using. Um, but in some instances, like this PVE, this peacekeeping build, um, I might double back and do more stuff later. We'll see kind of what that ultimately looks like, okay? So that's how talents work in Call of Dragons, and talents are very critical. Your talents only work on the primary hero. This is important. Also, your artifact will only work from your primary hero. So what do I mean by that? Every time you leave your city, depending on your hero level and your metal level, once you reach level 20, you can bring a second hero. And that second hero is really powerful, but he only brings his skills to the fight. So the second hero brings the skills. There's one other thing the second hero does, which is that they will bring half of their march capacity. Based on a hero's level, they have a march capacity. And you can see it over here, legion capacity. And when you bring a hero as a deputy, a secondary hero, then you get half of that capacity boost. So sometimes people will ask me in live streams, do the talents of the secondary hero matter? No. When you're the secondary, they don't apply. Um, their level is relevant, but it's halved. You get half the legion capacity boost you would have gotten from them. And the artifact, again, on the secondary hero doesn't matter. But let's talk about the artifact on the primary hero. Because artifacts are a big freaking deal in this game. Artifacts come in several rarities, and the higher the rarity, um, the more powerful it is, just outright. Now, that doesn't mean that every legendary is better than every epic. In fact, some epics are really, really good. Um, however, the legendary artifacts in this game are very powerful, and there are several vectors for getting upgrades to your artifact. One is increasing the level. To do that, you're going to use Arcane Dust, okay? Arcane Dust is a limited season-based currency. It is very important. Increasing the level will increase this first statistic you see here, magic unit defense, in the case of this particular artifact. You also can star up the artifact. So you can see this tier of Arben is four stars. The star level, you hit the question mark, it'll show you what, what boosts you get by virtue of increasing your star level. Now, if I show you a different artifact, maybe there's one that I could star up. Let's see here. Have I starred this one up? Oh, I already did. In fact, what I'll do is put on the screen um, a video of my starring up an artifact. You actually, to increase the star level, need to use patterns from other artifacts in order to star up your current artifact. So getting lots of artifact uh, draws is really, really good because you need them to star up other artifacts. Also, I can show you from all my artifacts over here that you can increase the skill level of an artifact. So not only, okay, can you boost the level, which increases the first stat, the star level, which increases the second stat you see here, but also you can increase the skill level to skill level five, and that will give it even more boosts. You increase the skill level by getting extra copies of the artifact. You also, by the way, are increasing star levels by having extra copies of any artifact of certain rarities, all right? Um, so artifacts are just insanely powerful, and the way that you're going to draw them is over here in the tavern. You see you click the center item. You can use these universal artifact compendiums to draw. There are also special artifact-based events that will eventually show up where you have a chance to get um, a sort of prioritization of certain rare artifacts, which is what I'm waiting for to really kind of go ham on artifacts in this game. Artifacts are insanely powerful, um, from Rise of Kingdoms, I really thought, like, oh, active skills are really crucial. And, like, they're good in this game, but artifact activations are insane. And it makes sense, because many artifacts have, like, a minute and a half or longer cooldown for how frequently you can use them. So they're very, very big effects that make the combat 
really, really fun and different in this game. One quick tip I want to give you about artifacts is that when you're looking at the artifact draw screen, you can hit the probability button to see all of the artifacts that you could draw from the keys. And one thing I really want to call your attention to as a beginning mistake that a lot of people are going to make is that you probably don't want to invest in an artifact that you think will work against other players, but does not. For example, if we look at this item over here, the Codex of Prophecy, it's really cool. It applies a shielding effect to your legions, and in fact, up to four nearby friendly legions. But this only works against Darklings, Dark Creatures, and Behemoths, which we'll cover later in the video, what those are from the map. This is not other players. So you probably want to invest in artifacts that worth work both against other players and also against player versus environment that's PvE objectives. The best artifacts by far include, for example, at the legendary tier, you've got Shadow Blades, also you've got the Phoenix Eye being really top tier. At the epic tier, you've got Heart Piercer and Magic Bomb. I made a dedicated video about that, however, card will be up in the top if you're looking for more information. One thing I wanted to circle back on is healing in your hospital because you get some amount of free healing per day and this is very very critical. You also can smash the resource based healing button to do resource healing instead if you like but this is extremely costly especially while you're still building up your city. I'm not saying you won't do it. I'm not saying you can't do it but the advice that I've been given is that if you've got the speed ups you might be better off actually just training more troops than trying to do lots and lots of resource-based healing. So one thing to consider as you're leveling up different parts of your city and looking at your policies is trying to get a magic combination of having enough of a certain troop type, also making sure that you've got enough hospital healing, and one really important trick is that you'll notice that the hospital healing number you see right over here, it's, it's a flat number, right? So what you can do is you could resource heal really low tiers of troops, and then all your free healing works on your higher tiers of troops. Because what this does is a number of troops per time period. It doesn't seem to matter. I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem to matter what troop type it is. So this is an important little trick to get a little bit of extra juice out of your hospital. If you want, you could resource heal your T1s. You know, let's say your gatherers got hit at some point, right? And then let the free healing happen for something more expensive like T4s. Now, on the topic of combat, let's talk troop types, baby. There's four different troop types in this game. You've got infantry, cavalry, uh, your archers, and your mages. And they actually counter each other in that order. So your infantry counters your cavalry, your cavalry counters your marksmen, your marksmen counter your mages. And these symbols show you what unit type uh, it is, okay? So this is an infantry unit, which is why that's in red. Um, and if we were to go to a different building over here, like this mage unit, we go over here, um, we click this, see, mages in red. Um, when you counter another unit or you have the advantage, you deal more damage to them and you take less damage from them. And it's something like 5 or 10%, I think, but it's a pr it ends up being a really, really big deal. It makes a huge difference. Now, what's interesting in this game is that the units are way more dynamic than in Rise of Kingdoms. Each faction's unit does different stuff. So, for example, the Vestals have an effect over here. They grant a health boost to nearby units, which is really cool. Um, the magic unit effect for other factions does other stuff. So this is a more nuanced topic that I don't want to get into here. I just want to point out that it exists so that you know about that. The other thing I'll point out is that you have these four troop training buildings. One of them is for your faction's special unit. Now, for me, you can see it's a magic unit. Okay, so I have two ways to make magic units using the League of Order, which I think is a very good thing. One very critical thing I want to add just about the units in the game is that it's important to look at what kind of damage that the unit does. Okay, if I tap the info screen for the unit, it's important to note that they are doing physical attack. This is my swordsman. Physical attack, melee range. If I look at another unit like these Vestals, these are mages, they do magic attack. Okay, and they attack from a very far range. Why does this matter? Well, some heroes really care about magic units and some heroes attack from far. For example, Lilia is a hero that if we look at her skills, she attacks from very far and she cares about magic units. If you put infantry with her march, 
you're not going to do very much damage because her abilities work off of what's called a magic damage factor. There's a physical damage factor. There's a magic damage factor. And if they don't say which they are, they actually work for both, which is a little unusual. Um, but the magic damage factor here will only be impressive if you bring the right unit type. If you bring infantry with Olia, she is going to do way, way, way less damage because that damage is based in part off of how many troops you have in your army and in part from the units that you've ultimately brought to the battle. An example of a physical hero, for example, would be uh, Bakar. We look at his ability, he is doing a physical damage factor of 600 on his active skill. Well, if you bring mages in his army, he's going to do way less damage because they don't do physical damage factor. So this is something very important to keep in mind when you're thinking about hero pairings and also uh, which troop type you put with the army. Don't worry, I have dedicated videos about each of these heroes, or at least I'm working on it. So um, if you're ever confused about what you should be using... Um, you can check out one of my videos, and as I mentioned, some of these heroes are flexible, like Eliana, for example, does magic damage factor if you have a magic unit, and physical damage factor if you bring a physical unit, or for example, other heroes like, let's look at Hosk, he doesn't even care at all, he just does a flat attack boost, a flat hit point boost, a flat damage dealt boost, whether it's magic or physical, you get the boost. So he's just extremely versatile. So just be on the lookout for when a hero has physical damage factor, and that's what you want to pair with another physical damage hero, whereas when a hero lists magic damage factor specifically, you want to pair with another magic damage factor hero. The other thing I will point out is that every faction has a dedicated gathering unit. So for me, at the cavalry stable, um, my tier one unit is not a cavalry unit, but for me, it's a workhorse. And workhorses basically have extra uh, boosts related to gathering, mostly capacity. So they can carry lots of resources. I love training these because uh, you really want to be able to uh, maximally leverage your gathering. I mean, I mean, gathering is crucial. I'll talk about that in just a second as one of the sort of hacks. But you can basically gather experience in this game, which is nuts. Um, also, the different... Uh, gathering units on the different factions have different bonuses, okay? But on the topic of gathering experience, because this is so key, uh, I am literally gaining experience from gathering, and that is because of my talent choices. And this is a topic I made a dedicated video about. Card will be up in the top, so I'll cover this only very briefly. But what you want to do at the start of the game is rush experience into your gathering heroes. That's Chakcha, Kella, Sword of Ordo, he only has the foundation talents for gathering. Also, you want to rush experience into Indus and Pan. And the reason is that right over here at the base, you get something called Earth's Grace, which gives you experience when you gather, and also another Earth's Grace talent point right over here. Those are the two you want to rush to. This gives you 20,000. This gives you 12 for a total of 32,000 free experience per day for your primary hero and your deputy hero. So you want to rush to three star all your gathering heroes so that they can bring a secondary you get enough talent points that you can get the gathering uh, experience boost and you just want to gather experience on your heroes i'm telling you this is gangbuster hero levels equals combat effectiveness and talent points so gather like a freaking madman at the start of the season not to mention that you get lots of resources which is a huge win now if you're wondering what other heroes to work on in call of dragons I would strongly recommend the following heroes in hero order. You want to work on Waldir, and if you are spending, you would do Lilia to pair with him, or you would do Velen, and Velen is amazing, especially if you're free to play. You're not going to have Lilia, you can go with Velen at the legendary tier. Really great combination of those two heroes. Also, if you wanted another mage that is epic, Alwyn is really good, but chances are you'll go one legendary, one epic, and that's a mage march, and that's a great spell. Great, great, great place to be. If you wanted to do a Marksman March, Nico comes from Gold Keys. Really amazing. You can pair with Gwanwin if you wanted. That is an epic. And eventually you could replace with Eliana, who you'll get from a special event, or Krieg, who you'll also get from an event. Krieg is really great. You're going to get a bunch of his tokens at the start. So it's very likely that if you're free to play especially, you might consider running that Nico krieg combo. Now, there is a pay-to-win, a pay-to-obtain hero. You use gems to get Kanara. 
Panara is another great hero, but you may or may not get her in the lucky spin. It depends entirely on your server. Kanara and Nico together are a great combo. Nico should be the primary and Kanara the deputy or secondary in that case. And that is a great combo if you wanted to run it. Those are the heroes I recommend you focus on. The reason I'm not recommending infantry or cavalry is because it takes a lot more skill to use them well. And generally, I think it is a lot more forgiving if you have a huge tech advantage. So if you are pay to win, then let me tell you, you're going to love your cavalry. If you are pay to win, you are going to love your infantry. If you are pay to win, you're going to love your flying heroes like Thea um, and also Atheus. Um, but they're just not quite as powerful if you are free to play. It, it just, they're the kind of hero, uh, in my opinion, where it's just really beneficial to have whaled up. So I think you'll much more enjoy the ranged heroes as your introduction to combat in the game. So those are the heroes that I would focus on at the start of the game. Now from here, the start of the game, well, Chisco, what about the end of the season? Because in this game, it's seasonal and there's resets and you're right. Um, if you go to the final building, I think we haven't talked about yet, it is the Augur Stone. The Augur Stone will show you the sort of chronicles for the season, the critical events that take place over the course of the season, and this very much sets the sort of tone for the things that are going to happen. But you can also see in the season section, um, in the season overview, what is reset at the end of the season. Now, in Call of Dragons, you keep your star level, you keep your skill level on your heroes, but the level of your heroes overall is reset back to level one. So you'll only be able to access those skills again as you level back up, okay? Same is true for your tactics manuals, which are used to level up heroes. Those all disappear. Your CP items will all disappear at the end of the season. Your artifacts will go back to level one. However, you keep your star level. You keep your uh, skill level on your artifacts. But the dust that is used to work on your artifacts is removed. So you want to use it all by the end of the season for the things you're doing in the season. Um, your policies will be reset. Your prestige, which is the currency you need for policies, is reset. Your merits, which are what you're given when you fight other players, are reset. Any medical supplies you have accumulated are reset. Your dragon trail is reset. You need to do that every season. And also there's a few other things like, for example, the alliance technology and all of the alliance buildings are reset every season. The season reset should be fun, a fresh start, I've got some questions about how enjoyable some of these things will be, like doing the Dragon Trail all over again, but the intention of the Season Reset is to reward activity, and active players, even if you're not spending, get a huge win from being super active at the start of the new season. So you may wonder, okay, just cool, what am I doing at the start of the season? First thing you need to do is get into a great alliance. And if you're looking for an alliance, consider joining my Discord server linked in the description. That's discord.gg slash chiscool. Um, there are many groups that are forming up, and I strongly recommend you get into a great group. It will make a huge difference for your progression in the game. But if we zoom way out at the map, one of the things you need to do is scout the map itself. There'll be a series of things that you can click into and do as you explore to get a bunch of free loot. You can do it, you cannot do it, it's not a ton of resources either way. I like getting all the value I can get, so yes, I've scouted the map, claimed the villages, claimed all the free resources on the map, and more. I recommend that you would do that. Now, one thing your alliance is going to do is build territory. This territory includes a fortress, and then after the fortress is built, you can connect flags. When you are on your alliance's territory, your city cannot be attacked. So you want to be on alliance territory as fast as you possibly can, and you want to stay on that alliance territory. Um, if an enemy destroys a flag that either is critical in connecting to your fort or is the one that you're on, then your city can be attacked. And if your city is attacked, things get interesting. And we'll talk about hospital healing in just a bit here. I want to show you more of the map first. One other thing that's critical on the map is these different holy sites or behemoths. Here there's a thunder rock. Here we've got a, a giant. And over here we've got a bear. Uh, where's the bear? Here's the bear. Okay, the giant bear. These give you buffs, and it's actually a raid encounter. You can bring in upwards of 40 players to fight the bear, to purify it or cleanse it, and then you can actually summon this behemoth to fight on your behalf. 
which is really nuts. You can only do that very infrequently, but it is really cool when you can go and do that. Also on the map, you'll find several things. Resource nodes are where you're going to gather. You want to do lots of that, okay? Uh, the Darklings are what you fight. You use this green currency called CP. We've been talking about this. Um, CP is what you use to fight these guys. And uh, you do that because they give you experience and other rewards, okay? Now, the Darkling patrols give you more experience, whereas these other guys, which have some very unique fighting styles, the Dark Creatures, give you a little bit of experience, but a lot of artifact dust. So this is how you level up your artifacts, okay? And in addition, on the map, you're going to find special chests. So for example, I'm pretty sure there's some right over here. See that? If you fight the guardians of the chest with your alliance, you can then use special keys. You can see that key design right over here to unlock the chest for loot. And you definitely want to do that. Okay. Every day you can only get two keys and you do that by fighting darklings and dark creatures. And you can only have an upwards of five keys saved up. So every day, ideally you want to spend down those keys um, so that you don't hit the maximum of five total that you can have in your inventory. In addition, every single day you should be looking to get done your challenges. Your challenges work toward a seasonal battle pass. You can either pay money for extra rewards or do the free version of the battle pass. And if I scroll all the way to the right, even the free version gets some legendary tokens, but only in the paid version will you get a legendary artifact as well. And as far as value goes in this game, the value is really, really high on the legendary artifacts. Of course, if what you wanted is a spending guide, I'll have a card up in the top of that video, which you can check out after this one is over, okay? So every single day, you're going to want to do your daily login quests. Ideally, you also do some weekly quests and get those done before end of week. And then there are also seasonal quests that you need to get done every week. Wow, I just realized I need to do two Darkling Forts. Hello, Chiskel. Hello. Okay. Uh, good thing we made this video together. I have two hours to get that done. GG. Um, so that's the core of the map. Okay. There's a lot more to fighting and combat in this game. All the card up in the top for a video with a live stream um, where our group was fighting another group and it's just like really crazy. That'll show you building, destroying, and all the sorts of stuff that you would want to know about combat in Call of Dragons. But there is one thing I want to tell you about moving around the map which is that you can, in this game, turn on what's called intercept mode. Intercept mode makes it so you can physically stop an enemy march from walking past you. This does mean, however, you will fight them. <laughs> so you could end up fighting other people, which you might not want to do. Um, so generally, intercept mode should be off. But when you're at war and you don't have allies from another alliance nearby, you might turn on intercept mode by using this button over here. Intercept mode will enter you into war frenzy which means you cannot activate a peace shield to protect your city. Um, but also, it will physically stop enemies from walking through you. This is very important if you're using infantry to block for mages or archers that are in your backline or cavalry to block, right? So keep that in mind when you're marching around, whether or not you have intercept mode on. But let's go now and let's look at alliances very briefly. Alliances are critical to your progression, okay? Not only because... Uh, you, ha you need a team to go do all the things that this game has to offer, uh, but also because whenever somebody buys something in your alliance or does, uh, you know, something like rallying a fort, um, you're going to get a bunch of chests. So these are chests that I got from other people buying stuff. These are chests that I got from free to play activities. And then periodically you'll get the blessing chest overall completed, which gives you even more rewards. Um, of course, rewards are not all that's here. There is also technology. Your reliance is technology that you should absolutely donate to at every possible opportunity, and that will give you currency to use in a store. You can use that currency as you see here. Also, when you fight other players, you will get merits, and you use merits at the merit store. Merits reset every week, so I actually have only a small number of hours to use up the uh, remainder of my merit currency. I believe it's only 20,000 will carry over to the next week. So between now and reset, I do need to spend another 9,207 currency at least. Otherwise, that currency will expire. You can even refresh the Merit Store to get more options in here, which is something I haven't done yet, but assuredly, when there's lots of fighting that I'm doing, that is something that I will do, okay? This is intended just to be an overview of all of the things you need to know at your 
crazy start in Call of Dragons. And I have had a lot of fun playing Call of Dragons so far, even though I am in arguably the single most insane server in the game. And if this is the sort of stuff you want to watch, you want to learn more about Call of Dragons, you want to see the end game stuff, then consider subscribing to the channel. And again, if you would throw a like on the video, it would support me profoundly. That's your way of giving me a high five for all of the information I've given you here. Check out the little info button for this video if you want to see any of the other videos that I've recommended, or you can just wait until the end screen where two of my favorites will be there that I think you'll really enjoy.